something important has come up. We've got a Soviet spy. We want you to defend him. I'm an insurance lawyer. I haven't done criminal work in years. Tell me what happened. They got our spy pilot or the head full of classified information. We've got their guy. We want you to negotiate the swap. What first caught my attention was just the um, bizarre series of events that led up to this, uh, you know, possible spy swap. Here's an insurance lawyer who is uh, uh, talked into taking the case of a Soviet spy. Um, he hasn't done any prosecution work since he worked at the Nuremberg war crime trials. And, uh, and so he immediately is a bit of a fish out of water, but he decides to take the case. And then he finds himself uh, defending someone he is quite um, fond of, or grows quite fond of, and vice versa, um, which, which creates a great deal of ambiguity. Now that kernel is what attracted me to this story. Oftentimes you play films with somebody who has no idea of what they're doing is thrust in a, into a circumstance where they have to figure things out very well. The truth is James B. Donovan was very, very sure of his, his uh, talents and abilities as a negotiator. So therefore the, the stress and the place for the nail biting tension in a movie like this, in a story like this, is how good the other side is at their skills of negotiation. And that, that's just the stuff of great drama. You're Agent Hoffman, yeah? Yeah. German extraction. Yeah, so? My name's Donovan, Irish, both sides, mother and father. I'm Irish, you're German, but what makes us both Americans? Just one thing, one, one, one. The rule book. We call it the Constitution, and we agree to the rules, and that's what makes us Americans. It's all that makes us Americans, so don't tell me there's no rule book, and don't nod at me like that, you son of a bitch. I think Tom's performance is just wonderful. And I don't know many people who can do that kind of uh, thing of a, of, of, of a heroic quality in a very normal, good man, found in a place in society where you would least expect to find it <laughs> amongst insurance lawyers. But you know what I mean? I think most people, Americans certainly, and I think maybe even English people and European people can connect with Tom, because he plays things just straight down the line. Have you represented many accused spies? This will be a first for the both of us. I wanted to show the audience that there was going to be an, an, an inevitability about the shoot down of Gary Powers and the Soviet spy. There was some, and, and, and the character of James Donovan that Tom Hanks plays, he actually just comes out and says that someday we may need uh, an insurance policy in our hip pocket somebody to trade with the Soviets. And so all of those were signposts, and I wanted the audience to kind of see where the story was going. But then there's a whole other story that you cannot predict, and that's where the Cohen brothers and Matt Sherman were very deft in erasing all of the corners and taking all the signs out. So you don't quite know where the story's going. Bridge of Spies really is the stories of a draw. They come, it's a tie. Both sides get what they want but without any real knowledge about the, the, the logic or the motivations of the other side, we don't know if it's gonna happen or not. We need this to be an exchange. No. I, I pretty much come to the set and say, here's where you should stand and here's where you should enter and here's where the camera's gonna be. And, and, and often I put it together right there in the room. I don't come in with a shot list. I don't come in with a schemata of arrows pointing to dolly track. And I just sort of come in, look at the set. Sometimes I do it the night before. Sometimes I get in early before the crew even shows up. And I walk the set with a work light on and uh, I figure out uh, my day or I figure out the first shot. And Tom's used to that. I mean, I, on Private Ryan, nobody knew where the camera was going except me and Janusz, you know? So everybody's pretty, pretty much used to rolling with the punches. And this was no different. He, he's just so enthusiastic about film. So it was, uh, we, whenever we weren't filming something, we were talking about films. And he would go home and on the weekend he would have watched five films. And every night he can hardly sleep, he's so excited. And he would get up and watch a couple of films from three or four in the morning and come in and I'd say, why can't you sleep, Stephen? Because I still don't know what this film is about. What's it about? I mean, what do you, I'd say, what do you mean, what's it about? And well, what's the central question of it? He was just, he's just a really, really fascinating person. What well, was exciting was when I shot the first scene with Tom and with Mark, 
Tom came out after I finally said print after five or six or seven takes. We shot the whole scene from top to bottom when they first meet from one angle. Then I covered it like crazy. And Tom pulled me aside and he just went, oh my God, Mark Rylance. And Tom was so excited. How did we do in there? Uh, not too good. Apparently you're not an American citizen. That's true. And according to your boss, you're not a Soviet citizen either. Well, the boss isn't always right, but he's always the boss. Do you never worry? Would it help? And the thing that Tom mentioned to me was interesting. He said, you know, Mark is playing it very, very secretly and very still. I am being seduced to be still, too. I can't do that. I have to stay James Donovan. I got to be the bulldog. Watch me carefully and don't let me be seduced into being as still as Mark because that's the character he's found. And I feel myself being pulled to his technique and I need to be the polar opposite of him. And that was a great note for an actor to give a director. An actor like Mark Rylance, he is a completely unknown entity in the, in the best of all possible ways. He gets to create something from whole cloth without being burdened by, you know, every other movie that he's ever made and had, had attention drawn into him. Now, that's going to change because he's going to be making an awful lot of uh, motion pictures uh, uh, beginning even after, even after we work together on, on Bridge of Spies. But even so, I think that because, you know, he, he, he's older, he's of an older generation, He's going to enjoy a chameleon-like existence for a very long time. People are scared of this man. He's a threat to all of us. Do you know how people will look at us? The family of a man trying to free a traitor? Everyone deserves a defense. Every person matters. I'm able to draw on the fact that I was a child of the, of the Cold War. I grew up under the, I've been saying, the shadow of the mushroom cloud. I know what it's like to have the air raid siren ring in school and you duck and cover under your desks and you get 16 millimeter Bell and Howe projectors rolled into the classroom and you see these half hour documentaries of what do you do when you're walking down the street and you see a bright flash? You know, go to the nearest wall and duck and cover. And here's Bert the Turtle, this little animated character that we actually grew up with, Bert the Turtle, who taught us how to go into our shells when the air, air raid sirens blast. And I was convinced we were gonna to go to war with the Soviet Union. I was convinced as a 13 year old. We little men, we just do our jobs. Like Lieutenant Powers, he's just a pilot. He was making photographs from 70,000 feet when he was shot from the sky. People in my country consider this an act of war. Well, the scenes we were shooting um, in Germany, of uh, the parts of Berlin where we could still shoot period buildings that hadn't been you know, torn down or replaced by modern buildings, um, a lot of the crew and a lot of the German crew would come over to me and they would say, you know, I was raised in the East and my uncle and aunt fled when the wall went up and we were stuck on one side and we, we, we didn't see them for a couple of years. Um, it was so interesting to get involved and in how what an emotional time that was for Germans and to have all my crew, German crew, uh, telling me stories of where they were when the wall went up. You're an American, you could well be detained. Definitely stay away from the wall. Cross it and you'll be shot. Uh, in some ways, it's, al it's almost a reassuring sort of uh, uh, look at the possibilities that can come across with uh, with intelligent people having intelligent discussions, um, and I think that ends up being one of the great powers of the cinema. It doesn't. It, you can get the same sort of sensibility of what would I do in that circumstances, whether or not it took place takes place in a galaxy far, far away, or it took place in 1961, or if it took took place last week. That that's what good movies do. They raise that question of what would you do in the same circumstances. Every movie I begin, it's, it's just, it's scary. It's scary because it's, a, it's an adventure and I don't know what's gonna happen on the film and I sometimes, if it's a special effects picture, I'm more confident because I've already pre vis half the picture and know exactly what I, what I need to get. But when it's a movie like Bridge of Spies or Amistad or Lincoln or even Saving Private Ryan where there were no storyboards except for the U2 shoot down, that was the only time I did storyboards on Bridge of Spies. But what I, have, I don't have that to fall back on. It's scary and it's exciting all at the same time because I get to make the movie in real time. 